be afraid. Don't 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 be afraid. It's a phrase that's used over and over and over in the Bible. You've read it like this, fear not, fear not. Today, we have a very important message that we're going to be showing you that's on that subject of not being afraid. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ray Waters, and I'm coming to you from Southern California, where Jane and I are. We are staying at our older son's house, Ray's house, Ray and Jen, and um, we're excited about being here we're also excited about being able to have a repeat service from the Village Church and one that we think is very practical and very helpful that deals with the subject of fear. I think you're going to be glad that you watched this morning. I want to say thank you for everybody who's watching. Village Church family, don't forget, we have now one more Sunday next week when we'll be off. And then the first Sunday of August, we'll be back having our services every Sunday in Hapeville. For those who are watching from around the country, thank you for sticking with us. Thanks for staying a part of our uh, community every single week that we are online. So we're excited about that. Can I say a prayer? And then we'll roll right into the talk. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for every person who's watching. Thank you for the idea that we don't have to be paralyzed by fear. We can walk this road of life and we can do it unafraid. Help us learn that today. For people who are hurting, may they receive some comfort and may they know that you care, that you love them. We thank you for this community. We thank you for this day. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Since she was a little girl, Michelle Poehler was afraid of big things many of us can identify with and also little things that most of us would think are kind of silly. She was afraid of spiders and roller coasters and snakes, I get the snakes, and skydiving. She was also afraid, though, of things like eating spicy food, petting dogs, holding cats, and changing her hair color. If you'd known Michelle as a little girl or a young adult, you might not have noticed that she restricted herself based on her long, long, long list of fears. You would have most likely considered her to be a lovely person who just wasn't very adventurous. She lived her life just playing it safe. She did one brave thing, though. That was the start of her personal transformation. She moved to New York to go to college. And while pursuing a master's degree in visual branding, Michelle was challenged by a professor to face her long list of fears. The professor asked the students to look deep into their souls and to write an essay about their best possible life 10 years from now. Now think about that. You're in a class, a professor says, I want you to look deep in your soul and I want you to write an essay about your best possible life 10 years from now. Now, I know this is church, not school, and I don't give homework, but since it's early in the year and we're working on becoming strong people who aren't held back by fear, I would encourage all of you to do that. Now, some of you are going to take me at this challenge, and you're going to find out it is well worth it. You spend a few hours this week with your computer in front of you or pen and paper if you prefer that way, and you think, what is my grandest hope for my life 10 years from now, what would it look like? And you write that essay. Write an essay describing your best possible life 10 years from today. What would it look like? What would you be doing then that you're not doing now? Michelle Poehler called the assignment a free pass to dream big. Now, that wasn't all there was to the essay, though. The professor also instructed the class to think of all the possible things that could get in the way of that ideal future, and then you narrow that down to one crucial obstacle. So you get your big dream, and then you figure out what are all the things standing in your way, and you narrow it down to that one biggest thing standing in your way. What's the one thing that has the power to derail this big dream? Is it a skill you don't have? Is it a mistake you find yourself making over and over and over again? Is it something you're not doing that you'd have to start doing before the dream could become a reality? For Michelle Poehler, that one crucial obstacle was fear. She knew she would never get near to her best possible life as long as she continued playing it safe. 
If she allowed herself to continue to choose comfort, she might have a good life, but it would not be the big fulfilling life of her dreams. Given 100 days to complete the project, Michelle made a list of 100 things she was afraid to do, and then, and this is crazy, she started doing them. One a day, one a day. When she got to fear number 39, which was donating blood, Michelle had an aha moment. She realized so many of the fears she had faced had things in common, so she didn't really have 100 fears. Really, she only had seven fears. Fears like pain, danger, disgust, embarrassment, rejection, loneliness, and control. By the time she marked number 100 off the list, Michelle had reprogrammed her tendency to react to situations by saying no thanks into this new way of thinking that said, let me try, let me try. Her story is very interesting. I was introduced to this story this week, and if you, many of you, I want you to look her up, Michelle Poehler, and look at a TED Talk Michelle Poehler did, and it is, it's interesting, and you'll, you'll be glad that you did. This is our third week to talk about fear, and I believe it's been very helpful to us. Uh, let me review for those who maybe have a tendency to forget and maybe to bring everybody up to speed. Not all fear is bad. There's a lot good about fear. There's a kind of fear that helps us survive. It's our earliest instinct. It's what causes us to, to run when we hear a lion sound when we're in the jungle 10,000 years ago. Those things are really important. Good fear teaches us that we should respect appropriate boundaries, that there are times when we need to move away from a situation. There are places where if you go there, you increase the chances of getting dramatically hurt. Good fear alerts us to these dangers. It keeps kids from touching hot stoves or going out too deep in the ocean and ignoring things like riptides. But what we've been spending most of our time on are bad fears that paralyze us from doing what we can do and what we ought to do. And I've had a real burden on my heart this morning about people who live their life controlled by their fears. And it's not necessarily the person that just wrings their hands in a corner that you say, obviously that person has fear issues. No, sometimes it's hidden behind bravado. Sometimes it's hidden behind the loudest voice. Sometimes it's the strongest looking person in the room, but they know deep down fear has them. Bad fear is a distorted fear. It's exaggerated. It's out of touch. And like Jimmy says, it ignores love, which freely flows in and through us and is available to us all the time. Over and over in Scripture, there are two kinds of mindsets laid out as possibilities for the human race. One is the mindset of faith. That mindset of faith says, I can trust God's goodness. I can trust God's power. I believe they're sufficient for my life. I believe I can live with a sense of, of relaxed confidence to do the things I need to do in a relaxed, confident way. Or there's the other mindset, which is the mindset of fear, which says I'm on my own. Unless I'm real careful and cautious, something really bad is going to happen to me, and I may not be able to handle it. The illusion the human beings have uh, is that it's not really me that's a, a, a fear issue. The issue is the, the circumstance. It's the circumstance that makes us fearful, but that's not true. It's the person. Let me give you an example. In the Bible, Moses sent out 12 spies to spy out the promised land. And so it's one, they're looking at one, they're all looking at the same thing, promised land. Ten of the spies came back and said, Aunt, can't do it. It's too scary. It's frightening. There, there are enemy armies over there, and they will kill us. It's going to be a disaster. No, we just need to stay right here in the desert because we cannot do that. Two of the people came back and said, oh, my gosh. It is the most beautiful place you could ever imagine. There are some difficulties we're going to have to overcome, but we got this. We've got to go. Was the circumstance different? No, the circumstance was exactly the same. It was people's perspective that made the difference. Same thing with uh, Goliath. Goliath had been taunting the armies of, of Israel. Uh, he was bigger and stronger and more powerful, and he, uh, the Philistines had more sophisticated war weapons. And so the Israelites were frightened. Every day Goliath would just shout to them, and, and they were scared to death. That's what they were looking at every day. Little David, a teenager, comes to the battlefield with some lunch prepared by his father to give to his big brothers. And little David looks at this huge giant, and the giant says all these scary things, and David says, I think with God's help, we can take him. 
I, I think I can get him. I think I got a slingshot. I think I can get him. Same circumstance, different perspective. Disciples on a boat with Jesus, middle of the night, storm comes up. Same situation, storm. Everybody's on the same boat. Disciples frightened. Lord, help us, save us, get up. What, something, we're going to die, we're going to drown. Same circumstance. Jesus stands up and says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? So it's our perspective. It's not the circumstance or the situation that's so important. And all these stories and many others like them, two sets of people in Scripture face exactly the same situation. They scout the same promised land. They look at the same enemy. They endure the same storm. Some respond with peace. Some respond with panic. What's the difference? It's a mindset. Now, today I want to talk to you about uh, the story of Moses, one particular aspect in the life of Moses. He's one of the most famous characters in the Bible. Many of the people here, older people, my age and older, we grew up watching the 1956 movie called The Ten Commandments. How many of you have seen The Ten Commandments? And who was Moses? Charlton Heston. He was a good Moses, too, for those of us that are that age. You younger people maybe learned the story of Moses from the 1998 animated film called Prince of Egypt. That's exactly right. But believe it or not, that story is in the Bible. If y'all wanted to read it in the Bible, you could read it in the Bible, too. It's in Exodus. And uh, just to give you some of the highlights, Moses was a Hebrew baby born during a time when the Jews were enslaved to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians, because of this population explosion of the Jews, they had become frightened that they were getting too strong. So they had set a decree that said all male babies would be put to death. So Moses' mother didn't want to do that. So she put him, do you remember, in the, in the water in a little bitty, uh, what do they call it, a basket in the water and uh, put him in the Nile River and just prayed something good was going to happen. And lo and behold, Pharaoh's daughter found this little baby in the Nile and took him into the palace, and Moses was raised as a son of Pharaoh. Great story. When Moses was 40 years old, he had begun to understand who his people were. He had begun to struggle with the fact that they were being abused and that they were being treated so horribly. And in a, in a fit of anger, watching his people abused, he, he killed a man. And then he said, this is all too much for me. And Moses fled Egypt and he goes to the wilderness and he begins to start over. He's living a real quiet life as a shepherd, far removed from Egypt, with no more dreams. He just wants to live this quiet little life. But one day while he was following some sheep in the wilderness, he came upon a burning bush. And through that burning bush, God chose to speak to him. In that moment, God placed a great task on Moses' shoulders. He gave him a dream that would shake Moses to his core. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This was no easy task that God had assigned to Moses. God was asking Moses to confront his brother, who was now the Pharaoh, the most powerful political figure in the world, and then to help liberate thousands and hundreds of thousands of Israelites, ending several hundred years of traditions of enslaving them. Let me reframe this for you. Moses believes he has been given a dream or vision to set the Jews free from their slavery to the Egyptians, but he is scared to death. Wouldn't you be? I know I would be. Moses understandably throws every excuse at God that he can think of. What if they don't believe that it's you that sent me? What if they don't listen to me? What if I'm scared? What if I'm not a good leader? What if I don't speak well in front of crowds? Finally, he pleads with God, please send somebody else. But God says, no, Moses, you trust me and you go in my power and you're going to set my people free. Well, the story is a beautiful look at a man paralyzed in fear. Finally being able to trust this love of God. Finally being able to trust and turn and walk through his fear into one of the most glorious salvations the world has ever known. PhD Susan Jeffers, one of the leading authorities on fear, writes about three levels of fear. And I want you to think about your fear, okay? Because this, if this is just talk, 
who cares? If you put yourself in the talk, then it can really matter. So you put yourself in the talk. Susan Jeffers talks about three levels of fear. The first level of fear she talks about is situation-oriented fear. And she divides it into two categories. One is things that just happen. For example, some people are really afraid of aging. And you say, is that true? That's, that's really true. Um, as a young guy, I, I looked older. Uh, John Fleming said, I, I looked older. When I was 16, 17, I looked a little older than the other guys. And that was cool to me. And then I was 23, and I looked 30, and that was pretty cool. And then I was 30, and I looked 40, and that was all right. And then I started looking way older than me. And then I started catching up. And then I realized, oh, my gosh, I'm getting old old and you begin to get a little fearful i've gone through that we're just fearful of getting oh what is getting old like some people have a fear of becoming disabled some people have a fear of retirement they cannot comprehend retirement some have a fear of being alone some have a fear of dying some have a fear of losing a loved one they say don't i can't i i, I can't don't 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 I, I, that can't i'm afraid i cannot lose that person so under situated oriented fear, there are those things that just happen. And then there are those things that require action. She said people are afraid of things like going back to school. And I've known people, they, they knew they needed to go get their diploma or they needed to get their GED or they needed to go to that graduate level class. They need to finish something they started. They knew that, but they were just afraid. I have a friend, he's an educator. He's now a counselor. He's been in public education 35 years. The start of every school year, about two weeks before, he calls me because he goes into the deepest fear you can possibly imagine for the two weeks leading up to school, and it normally ha happens to him for a week into school before it finally releases, but that's fear he faces. Changing a career, that's a fear people have. They know they need to change the career, but they can't. They're just paralyzed. They don't know how to do it. Ending or beginning a relationship. They know they should. Everything about it is toxic. They understand that but they are frightened about that. Going to the doctor. I have friends that I love. They're smart, brilliant people in every way, but they are afraid to go to the doctor because they're, they would rather not know something bad than go to the doctor and maybe find out that there's a solution to maybe what their struggle is. Losing weight. Some people have a fear, believe it or not, of losing weight. It sabotages their, their prog progress. So that's level one, situational oriented fears. Level two involves the ego. It's said in a little different way. Things like rejection. I have a fear of rejection. Or success. I have a fear of success. Or failure. I have a fear. Or disapproval. Or losing my image. Or being vulnerable. So Jeffers lays this out. And then she says, she says, Level three is the biggest fear of all and actually is the real question behind every one of our fears. This is what she says it is. What if I can't handle it? That's, that's the, the essence of what's behind every one of our fears. What if I can't handle it? At the bottom of every one of our fears is simply the fear that you can't handle whatever life may bring you. What if I can't handle aging? What happens if I become disabled and I, I can't handle it? What happens if I get retired and then I don't know how to be retired? Or, or what happens if I'm forced to be alone, if Jane uh, dies before I do? But what happens if, if that happens? That I, I don't know if I can handle that. Or, or, or what if I go back to school and I don't know how to go back to school? Or what if I change careers, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to change that? I, I don't know if I can handle that. What if I go to the doctor and what if the doctor gives me some bad news? I don't know if I can handle that. Or those uh, involving the ego, what if someone rejects me? I can't, I can't handle rejection. Or what if somebody thinks that my image is not what I have always wanted to portray it as? Or what if someone disapproves of me? All these things are the essence of where our fears come from. My study of fear confirms exactly what Susan Jeffers discovered. Our big issue underlying all of our fear is what if I can't handle it? I'll tell you a story where I first began to realize this. Um, I pastored three churches before I was 24 years old, all right? So I hit the blocks and fired out pretty fast. I also flamed out fast and went through a divorce. And basically because of the theology as I understood it at that point in my life, thought because of divorce, I was disqualified from ever being a pastor. Some people still believe that. That's fine. I totally get it. That's fine. So I just, I just feel like God has told me that I'm supposed to be a pastor, but then because my life flames out at 24, I'm sitting on the sidelines and I'm not going to be a pastor 
And over the next couple of years, God begins to stir in me and begins to call me. And, and I, I can tell you very, very authoritatively that I believed in my heart certain things God was telling me. I believe with everything in me that God spoke into my heart and said, Ray, I don't throw away broken things. I fix and use broken things. I can, I, I can tell you the place he said those words in my spirit. I know that. Then I know I can take you to the place where God said to me, Ray, you will be a pastor to people who do not have a pastor. And, and I've never doubted those words, never doubted those words. And then I can go to the place where God said, Ray, you are to start a church, and it will be a different kind of church, but you are the person for this. And then I began to do exactly what Moses did, exactly. Uh, have you heard about my divorce? Because that's not good. That is not, that is like terrible. That is not good. I've just, I've flamed out, and I know I was young, but it doesn't matter. I flamed out, and God, you need to look around, and this is not good. Or I don't have anybody that would come to a church. I, what, there's no people. It'd just be me. I'd just be standing in the middle of the room by myself. Or don't you have to have some money if you start a church? I don't have any money, nor do I know any people that have any money. Or I don't know how to organize things like that. I always would go into churches that had um, lost their crowd and were struggling. And then because I was this young preacher, I would uh, enter the situation, and there would be some enthusiasm, and people would kind of get excited, and the church would grow. And then I moved to another church, and it was the same kind of thing. So I would go into already existing organizations. I don't know how to start this from, from nothing. So I would go through all of these things over and over and over again and think, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. But finally, I realized I have to because it wouldn't leave me alone. I knew that I was having this tug every day, and I knew I was going to have to do something, something. I had to do some work to get to the point. I tell you, if you can imagine kind of a slope up, that's when, when fear has you, everything is just a struggle, 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 struggle. But once you reach that point where you say, I'm going to handle this, I'm, I'm facing this, it's almost like you come over the edge, and suddenly you begin to work on the the solution side. And that's what began to happen. We began to work on the solution side. And, and some things began to happen for me. Two things were very helpful in, in this whole process for me. One, there was something that had been placed in me from my father from my earliest childhood, but I had forgotten it. And that was the idea that I can learn some things that I need to know to move forward. Like I was paralyzed because I only had limited information. And so it's like, I don't know how to do what's over there. I don't know what that looks like. But my dad had taught me from the time I was a kid that I, I was smart. I was a learner. You can learn those things. And so I began to think, I guess I could learn what I need to know about starting a church. I guess I can learn those things. I guess I can learn how to invite people. I, I can learn those things. So that was important. But the other thing was this. There was this sense that God was with me, and I was going to be filled with his power and energy and I was going to enjoy his favor along the way. And things that needed to happen were going to happen. And I finally came to the point where I believed that. In other words, whatever happens to me, given any situation, I can handle it. I can handle it. Can I tell you something? You can too. You can too. Whatever it is that has you locked up, whatever it is that you are so afraid of, you don't even know what you're going to do, you can handle it. You can handle it. God's love flowing through you. You can handle it. You can handle it. Failure? Guess what? Failure comes. I've had more failures than almost anybody I know. And I'm not just, that's not microphone talk. That is true talk. I have had failures. Guess what I have learned? I can handle it. I can handle it. Success? I've had a little. Guess what I can tell you? I can handle it. Finding a building, I remember so glad to see Laura Murphy here today. When we moved up to Hapeville, we felt God was leading us up to Hapeville, but we just didn't know where to be in Hapeville. But I never will forget, our paths crossed, and I had known her for a long time, but she had a building, which was across the street, most charming little building. It was filled to the roof with more junk than I've ever seen in my life. And we almost killed ourselves emptying that building when she said we could meet there, didn't we? I see Kelly and some of you were shaking your head. We almost died. But it became, the, we could handle it. We can handle it. 
And it's the most charming place, the most charming place. And then we outgrew that place. And it was amazing how a guy in our church that's no longer in our church, but he just knew uh, the guy who owned this place, Don Jackson. And so we talked to Don Jackson, who was closing it down. I remember when he was closing it down. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll rent it to you. In fact, we'll make it a rent to own kind of a thing. If you guys ever get strong enough that you want to buy it, then you can buy it. And uh, we've discovered along the way, in every way, we can handle it. And you can handle it too. The Apostle Paul was in prison and he wrote some of the most immortal words in all of the Bible. Now this is a guy in prison, okay? So he's not, this is not, I've just bought my mansion and I've got my, my beautiful car in the driveway and we're planning our summer cruise and I'm doing so good and I just want to say a praise to God. That's good if that's you, that's good. No, no, Paul is in prison. And you remember what he said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 on the screen? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Would you say that with me, please? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This is so important because if you want to live your best life, you have to be able to move through your fears. That's what I'm feeling this morning is a sense of emotion and pain because I know some of you are settling for a lesser life because of your fear. I really believe there are many in this place this morning who are stuck because fear stands in front of you and you don't know how to get to the other side, but you've got to get to the other side. I have realized that many settle for living their fears instead of living their dreams, and there's a huge difference there. You don't want to spend your life living your fears. You want to spend your life living your dreams. Don't let that be your story. Now, I heard an old story that illustrates this well. heard this a long time ago. I like it. There once was a criminal who had committed a terrible crime, and he was sent to the king for his punishment. The king told him he had a choice of two punishments. He could be hung by a rope or take what's behind the big, scary, dark iron door. The criminal quickly decided on the rope. As the noose was being slipped over his head, he turned to the king and said, by the way, out of curiosity, what's behind that big, scary, dark iron door? The king laughed and said, you know, it's funny. I offer everybody the same choice, and nearly everybody picks the rope. So said the criminal, tell me what's behind the big, dark, scary iron door. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to tell anybody, pointing to the noose that's now around his throat. The king paused and said, freedom freedom, but it seems most people are so afraid of the unknown that they immediately choose the rope. Alan Watts, British philosopher and writer and speaker, says this, our lives are one long effort to resist the unknown. And it's in the unknown that you find some of the greatest joys ever. The result is we're a planet full of folks walking around with metaphorical ropes around our necks, wondering why we feel a bit emotionally and spiritually dead to the world that's all around us. Power phrase, power phrase. On the other side of fear, there's potential. On the other side of great fear is even greater potential. Would you say that with me? On the other side of fear, there is potential on the other side of great fear is even greater potential. Let me tell you why this is important. If you don't step out and live your life, your dream, you're depriving yourself of the life you were created to live and you are preventing the world from knowing the real you and benefiting from your great contribution. There are some things that need to be done in this world that would make this world a better place, but you have to have your Moses moment and you have to walk through your fear, trusting in God's great love for you, or it won't get done. You have to say no to destructive fear. All of us have to. And that doesn't stop. We never get to a point where fear suddenly leaves us. No, if you are stretching, if you are stretching, you will constantly be confronted with fear. I have, I have walked through more fear the last 12 months than I have at any other time in my life. You say, you're afraid? I'm telling you there are things that I'm walking through right now that are so fearful, but it's because I'm stretching into new areas of living. And at every new step, there's a fear of what if I can't do this? And then there's the reminder, you can learn what you need to learn and don't forget God is with you always. And you can get through it. As long as you're stretching and growing, fear is going to rise up to try to prevent you along your path. 
One of my great heroes is Bill Hybels, pastor from Chicago. He said this, history is filled with men and women who said no to destructive fear and they changed the world. But imagine if they had given into the paralyzing effects of fear. Just imagine. Imagine the Apostle Paul fearing resistance or rejection, choosing to stay home rather than to embark on his missionary journeys that took the message of Jesus to the known world. Can you see Paul saying, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do this. Imagine the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. giving speeches filled with just gentle hints about the evils of segregation because he feared pushing too hard. I don't know if I can do this. Instead, King powered through and championed the civil rights movement against racial segregation in the United States with a powerful prophetic message calling racism what it is, evil, evil. Imagine Rosa Parks during the same era in American history submitting to the bus driver's command to give up her seat to a white person when she knew that kind of segregation had gone on far too long. What if she had sat there and said, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. Imagine Nelson Mandela looking the other way when he witnessed it and experienced apartheid in South Africa because he didn't want to make a fuss. I don't know if I can do this. Instead, he spent 27 years in prison and then brought apartheid onto the world's radar, helping in the centuries-old regime of oppression. Or how about Malala Yousafzai passively quitting school because she was too frightened by the death threats from the Taliban extremist? I don't know if I can do this. Instead, she became even more vocal about the educational rights of children and women. She survived a 2012 assassination attempt, and she was a Nobel Peace Prize nominee in 2013 and 2014. She's now just 20 years old, and she is making an incredible difference in the world. And imagine you, fully aware of the big things God has placed in your life, fully aware that God is calling you to something. You know there are things you need to do, but because of fear, you're saying, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do it. Imagine. Moses learned that God was enough. God would be with him. God would give him all he needed to make it through. I have learned the very same thing over and over and over again. God is with me. He is with you. There's no need to let fear hold you back. Last Monday was Martin Luther King Day, and I didn't mention it last Sunday, and, uh, but I was sure thinking about it. I want to tell you about a six-year-old girl who was able to walk through fear in a most profound way. Her name was Ruby, Ruby Bridges. Many of you know who she was. Many of you know who she is. She lived in New Orleans. When she was six years old, a federal judge said the schools in that city had to open their doors to African-American children. The day when little children will be separated because of the color of their skin was over in America. Almost all of the white parents decided that if they had to let black children in, then they would keep their children home. You say, really? Look it up on YouTube and listen to the interviews and cry. They also said that if any black children actually came, these white parents said, there would be trouble. So the black children basically stayed home too for fear of what was going to take place, except for Ruby. Every day, six-year-old Ruby Bridges would kiss her mom goodbye and she would march off to school. Only she had two federal marshals walking in front of her and she had two federal marshals walking behind her. She needed them because she had to walk through a heckling crowd into an empty school building because she was the only one going to school. She had to walk through a crowd of people and they shook their fist at her. Watch the videos on YouTube. They shook their fist at her, a six-year-old little girl. They yelled at her and they threatened her and her family. If she was going to keep coming back to school, they made it fierce. Every morning at 10 minutes to 8, Ruby Bridges walked past all these people with her head up and her eyes straight ahead. She walked into that empty school building to learn. Then she went home every day. What's amazing about her is not just that she kept coming back. What's really amazing about her is how she did it. Her white school teacher described what she saw when Ruby walked into the school. This is what she said. Now listen to this. This is a teacher describing this six-year-old girl. She said, I saw a woman spit at Ruby, but miss. Can I read that again just because that's hard to grasp? I saw a woman spit at Ruby, but miss. Ruby smiled at her. I saw a man shake his fist at her, and Ruby smiled at him. Then she walked up the stairs, and she stopped at the school building door, and she turned, and she looked at the crowd, 
And she smiled one more time. Do you know what she told one of the marshals? The teacher continues. She told him that she prays for those people, the ones in the mob, every night before she goes to sleep. A six-year-old girl kneeling by the side of her bed saying, God bless those people who are mad at me. Please help them, God. Then the next morning, the little six-year-old girl gets up, kisses her mom and dad goodbye, and walks to school with two U.S. marshals in front of her and two behind her. This is where the story gets interesting to me. There's a Harvard psychiatrist by the name of Robert Coles. Look him up. Watch his interview on YouTube. He went to New Orleans to interview this little girl. He wanted to know what gave her that courage, that kind of heart. How can a six-year-old be like that? So he goes to New Orleans, leaves Harlem, goes to New Orleans to interview her and her family. And he found that conventional psychiatric and psychological language could not explain this little girl and her courage. He wrote a fascinating book you need to look at called The Moral Life of Children. In it, This is what this non-believing, he is a total secularist, is not religious at all, this non-believing Harvard psychiatrist said about the six-year-old girl, Ruby Bridges, about what made her the way she is. He said, if I had to offer an explanation, and again, we're talking about a secular Harvard professor. If I had to offer an explanation, I think it would start with the religious tradition of black people, which is of far greater significance than many white observers have tended to allow. This is his language in the 1970s, early 70s, describing what he saw in the 60s. In home after home, I have seen Christ's teachings, Christ's life connected to the lives of black children by their parents. Such a religious tradition connects with a child's sense of what is important. As anyone knows who has been to a black church and seen the look of pain give way to the look of hope. This Harvard psychiatrist came down to New Orleans to look at this amazing thing and he said, I think it's Jesus. I think it's Jesus. Ruby was this little six-year-old girl who didn't really go to school alone. Not in her mind. It wasn't the marshals who gave her courage, and it wasn't the authority of a federal judge who gave her her strength. Not really. That's something that no government or political or human power can do for her or for you. There is no human resource. There's no amount of merely human strength or courage that can transform a heart like that. That takes Jesus, and little six-year-old Ruby Bridges knew about Jesus. She knew that he understands all things about facing hostile crowds. He knew what it was like to have someone spit at him and mock him and threaten him just for doing right things. And yet he never, ever threatened back. He never stopped loving and the very people who were so ugly to him, all he knew how to do or all he did was pray for them. Ruby knew about Jesus Somehow she knew that she was not going to school alone. So this six-year-old girl kept walking down a very hard road because she walked it with God who knows all things about hard, long roads. That's the how, that's how a little girl stood up to her fears. That's how a little girl learned that God's love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out some of you, and I remind myself of this all the time, I need to learn to be more fearless. I need to see what fear is and realize life, great life, is just on the other side. Would you bow your heads, please? God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for touching us and reminding us we can do this we can do this whatever it is that is standing as that big fear block in our path we can get through this we can face it head on with you in us we are more than enough so Lord let us live our dreams let us accomplish those things you've placed deep in our hearts let us not settle for living our fears may we live our dreams and i thank you for this and i pray this in jesus name amen thank you all for the way that you listen and i want you to think about it now i'm serious think about fear Think about what you need to power through. Let God 
take you there. Do me a favor, hug or at least shake hands with a couple of people before you get out of here, all right? Just let people know it's been good to see them. Enjoy the weather. Go to the park. Have a beautiful day. Blessings to you.